One of the most profound metaphysical influences upon both the Muslim and Christian worlds is Ibn al-Arabi, the Sufi, uh, called in Arabic the greatest master. Uh, he was a descendant of Hatim el tai still famous among the Arabs as the most generous man who ever lived and mentioned in Fitzgerald's Rubaiyat. Spain had been an Arab country for more than 400 years when Ibn al-Arabi, the Mercian, was born in 1164. Among his names is the Andalusian, and he was undoubtedly one of the greatest Spaniards who ever lived. It is commonly believed that there is no greater love poetry than his. Nor was there ever a Sufi who so profoundly impressed the orthodox theologians with the interior meaning of his life and work. His Sufi background, according to biographers, was that his father was in contact with the great Abdul Qadir Jilani, Sultan of the Friends. Ibn al-Arabi himself is said to have been born as a result of the spiritual influence of Abdul Qadir, who predicted that he would be a person of outstanding gifts. His father was determined to give him the best possible education, something which was offered in Moorish Spain at the time to a degree almost unparalleled elsewhere. He went to Lisbon, where he studied law and Islamic theology. Next, while still a boy, he went on to Seville, where he learned the Quran and the traditions under the greatest scholars of the time. At Cordoba, he attended the classes of the great Sheikh El Sharat and distinguished himself in jurisprudence. During this period, Ibn al-Arabi showed qualities of intellect far beyond those which distinguished his contemporaries, even though they were drawn from the scholastic elite, in whose families such intellectual capacity was proverbial. During his adolescence, in spite of the severe discipline of the academic schools, he spent his free time almost entirely with the Sufis and began to write poetry. He lived in Seville for three decades, his poetry and eloquence winning for him a place second to none in the highly cultivated atmosphere of Spain, as well as in Morocco, which was itself a center of cultural life. In some ways, Ibn al-Arabi resembled El Ghazali. Like him, he came from a Sufi family and was to influence Western thought. At the height of his greatness, Ibn al-Arabi maintained, through associations and poetry, a continuous contact with the Sufi stream. Ghazali reconciled Sufism with Islam, making the scholastics understand that it was not a heresy, but an inner meaning of religion. Ibn al-Arabi's mission was to create Sufi literature and cause it to be studied in order that people might thus enter into the spirit of Sufism, discover the Sufis through their being and expression, whatever their cultural background might be. How this process worked is exemplified in a comment by the distinguished Professor R. A. Nicholson, who translated El Arabi's Interpreter of Desires. Some of the poems, it is true, are not distinguishable from ordinary love songs. And as regards a great portion of the text, the attitude of the author's contemporaries, who refused to believe that it had any esoteric sense at all, was natural and intelligible. On the other hand, there are many passages which are obviously mystical and give a clue to the rest. If the skeptics lacked discernment, they deserve our gratitude for having provoked Ibn el-Arabi to instruct them. Assuredly, without his guidance, the most sympathetic readers would seldom have hit upon the hidden meanings which his fantastic ingenuity elicits from an Arabic Qasida. A very great deal of Ibn al-Arabi's writings remain in a light case up to this day, as far as others than Sufis are concerned. Some of his material is addressed to those who have a grasp of ancient mythology and is couched in those terms. Some, which connects with Christianity, serves as a lead-in to people with a Christian commitment. Other poetry serves to introduce the Sufi way by means of love poetry. No single individual can unravel all his work only by means of scholastic, religious, romantic, or intellectual equipment. This brings us to another hint of his mission, which is contained in his name. 
According to Sufi tradition, Ibn al-Arabi's mission was to scatter Sufi lore throughout the contemporary scene, connecting it with the existing traditions of the people. This sense of scatter is perfectly legitimate and in accordance with Sufi thinking. As the Sufic term for scatter, Nash, was not at the time used publicly, Ibn al-Arabi employed an alternative word for it. He was known in Spain as Ibn Saraka, son of a small saw. Saraka, however, from the root SRQ, stands for another word for saw, derived from the NSHR root. The NSHR root, when normally inflected, means publication, spreading, as well as sawing. It also means revivification. Muhyuddin, Ibn al-Arabi's personal name, translates as reviver of faith. Taking the NSHR root literally, as most scholars were bound to do, has caused even such a respectable historian as Ibn al-Abar to conclude that his father was a carpenter. He could only have been a carpenter in the secondary sense, known to Sufis who adopted guild terms for their meetings to account for the collection together in any one place of a number of people who did not want to appear to be a subversive group. Taken on their own, some of the statements of Ibn al-Arabi are startling. In Bezels of Wisdom, he says that God is never to be seen in an immaterial form. The sight of God in woman is the most perfect of all. Love poetry, as with everything else to the Sufi, is capable of reflecting a complete and coherent experience of divinity while concurrently fulfilling various other functions. Every Sufi experience is an experience in depth and in qualitative infinity. It is only to the ordinary man or woman that a word has only one meaning or an experience less than a large number of equally valid whole significances. This multiplicity of being is something which, although accepted as a contention by non-Sufis, is frequently forgotten by them when they deal with Sufi material. At best, they can generally appreciate that there is an allegory, which means to them just one alternative meaning. To the theologians committed to a literal acceptance of divine formalism, Ibn al-Arabi bluntly says that angels are the powers hidden in the faculties and organs of man. It is the Sufi's objective to activate these organs. Unmindful of the difference between formulation and experience, Dante took over Ibn al-Arabi's literary work and crystallized it. And in so doing, he robbed Ibn al-Arabi's message of its Sufic validity and merely left us with an embalmed example of what to the modern mind would almost amount to piracy. Raymond Lully, on the contrary, took over literary material from Ibn al-Arabi, but in addition emphasized the importance of the Sufi exercises which are necessary to complete the Sufic experiences. Ibn al-Arabi, who studied under the Spanish woman Sufi Fatima Waliya, was undoubtedly subject to special psychic states. He refers to these on various occasions. Some of his work was written in trance, and its meaning did not become clear to him until some time after its writing down. When he was 37, he visited Sota, where the renowned Ibn Sabine, who advised the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick, had his school. There he had a strange vision or dream, which was interpreted by a famous scholar, the source of his inspiration was reverie in which the consciousness was still active. By the exercise of this Sufi faculty, he was able to produce from the innermost mind a contact with supreme reality. The reality which he explained underlay the appearances of the familiar world. His teachings stressed the importance of this exercise of faculties which are unknown to most people and consigned to credulous occultism by the many. A person, he said, must control his thoughts in a dream. The training of this alertness will produce awareness of the intermediate dimension. It will produce great benefits for the individual. Everyone should apply himself to the attainment of this ability of such great value. It is quite hopeless to attempt an interpretation of Ibn al-Arabi from a fixed position. 
His teachings are derived from the inner experiences, then presented within a form which itself has a function. Where his poetry has a double meaning, and it often has, he intends not only to convey both meanings, but to affirm that both are valid. What he is doing here is to address himself to people in terminology which forms a part of their own cultural background. There are poems of Ibn al-Arabis which can be read in a shifting sense, the meaning starting in one theme and drifting into another. He has done this deliberately in order to prevent the automatic associative processes from carrying the reader away into ordinary enjoyment because El Arabi is a teacher, not an entertainer. For Ibn El Arabi, as for all Sufis, Muhammad represents the perfected man. At the same time, it is necessary to know what is meant by Muhammad. In this context, Ibn El Arabi is more explicit than most on this point. There are two versions of Muhammad, the man who lived in Mecca and Medina, and the eternal Muhammad. It is this latter one of whom he speaks. This Muhammad is identified with all the prophets, including Jesus. This idea has caused people with a Christian background to claim that Ibn al-Arabi or the Sufis or both were secret Christians. The Sufi claim is that all the individuals who have performed certain functions are in a sense one. This oneness they call in its origin the reality of Muhammad. Jili, in his standard Sufi text, The Perfect Man, explains the incarnation of this reality among all peoples. He seeks to describe the essential factor by showing the multiplicity of what we call an individual. Muhammad, for instance, means the praised one. Another name, which is only a description of a function, is Father of El Qasim. In his name of Abdullah, he stands for its literal meaning, Servant of God. Names are qualities or functions. Incarnation is a secondary factor. He is given names, and in every age has a name which is appropriate to the guise in which he appears in that age. When he is seen as Muhammad, he is Muhammad. But when he is seen in another form, he is called by the name of that form. This is not a reincarnation theory, however much it may resemble one. The essential reality which activates the man called Muhammad or anything else has to be given a name in conformity with the environment. <laughs> Those who have identified this attitude with the Logos doctrine of Plotinus are, according to the Sufis, ascribing a historical connection to a situation which has objective reality. The Sufis did not copy the Logos doctrine, though the idea of the Logos and of the reality of Muhammad have a common source. Ultimately, the source of Sufi information on this, as on other points, is the personal experience of the Sufi, not the literary formulation, which has been one of its historical manifestations. The trap of historical thinking, which assumes no basic interior source for knowledge and has to seek literary and superficial inspiration, is constantly avoided by the Sufi. Several Western students of Sufism have, it must be admitted, emphasized that similarity of appearances and of terminology or of date, but do not prove transmission of the essential idea. Ibn al-Arabi confused the scholars because he was what is called in Islam a conformist in religion while remaining an esoterist in inner life. Like all Sufis, he claimed that there was a coherent, continuous, and perfectly acceptable progression between formal religion of any kind and the inner understanding of that religion, leading to a personal enlightenment. This doctrine, naturally, could not be accepted by theologians, whose importance depended upon more or less static facts, historical material, and the use of reasoning powers. Like Ghazali, his intellectual powers were superior to those of almost all his more conventional contemporaries. Instead of making use of these abilities to carve a place in scholasticism, he claimed, like many another Sufi, that when one has a powerful intellect, its ultimate function is to show that intellectuality is merely a prelude to something else.
Such an attitude may seem like impossible arrogance unless you have actually met such a person and known their humility. Many people sympathized with him but did not dare to support him because they were working on a formal plane and he on an initiatory one. One respected divine is on record as saying, I have no doubt at all that Muhyuddin ibn al-Arabi is a deliberate liar. He is a chief among heretics and a hardened Sufi. The great theologian Kamaluddin Zamla Khani, however, exclaimed, how ignorant are those who oppose the Sheikh Muhyuddin ibn al-Arabi. His sublime sayings and the precious words in his writings are too advanced for their understanding. On a famous occasion, the renowned teacher, Sheikh Zaydin ibn Abdus Salam, was presiding over a group of students of the religious law. During a discussion, the question of defining hypocritical heretics arose. Someone cited Ibn al-Arabi as a prime example. The teacher did not challenge the assertion. Later, when dining with the teacher, Salahuddin, who later became the sheikh of Islam, asked him who was the most eminent sage of the age. He said, what is that to you? Eat on. I realized that he knew, stopped eating, and pressed him in God's name to tell me who it was. He smiled, then said, the sheikh Ibn al-Arabi. For a moment I was so amazed that I could say nothing. The sheikh asked me what was the matter. I said, I am in wonderment because this very morning a man has stated that he is a heretic. On that occasion you did not contest it. Now you call Muhyuddin the magnetic pole of the age, the greatest man alive, the teacher of the world. He said, but it was in a meeting of scholars, legists. The main opposition to Ibn al-Arabi was due to his truly amazing collection of odes, love poetry known as the interpreter of desires. The poetry is so sublime, has so many possible meanings, is so full of fantastic imagery that it can exercise a magical effect upon the reader. For the Sufis, it is regarded as the product of the most advanced development of human consciousness possible to man. It is only fair to add here the D.B. MacDonald considers Ibn al-Arabi's outpourings as a strange jumble of theosophy and metaphysical paradoxes, all much like the theosophy of our day. For scholars, one of the important things about the interpreter is that there is extant a commentary on the poems made by the author himself, in which he explains how the imagery fits in with orthodox Islamic religion. How this came about can only be studied against the background of the book's history. El Arabi decided to go on the pilgrimage. After spending some time in traveling through North Africa, he arrived in Mecca and there met a group of Persian immigrants, mystics who welcomed him into their fold, in spite of the fact that he had been accused of heresy and worse in Egypt he narrowly escaped an attempt by a fanatic to murder him. The chief of this Persian community was named Mukinuddin. He had a beautiful daughter, Nizam, devout and well-versed in the religious law. His spiritual experiences in Mecca and his symbolical rendering of the path of the mystic are expressed in love poems dedicated to her. El Arabi realized that human beauty was connected with divine reality, and for this reason he was able to produce poems which both celebrated the perfection of the maiden and also, in correct perspective, stood for a deeper reality. But the capacity to see the connection was denied to the formal religionists who professed themselves scandalized. The poet's supporters have pointed out often in vain that real truth may be expressed in several different ways simultaneously. They refer to Ibn al-Arabi's use of myths and legends as well as traditional history to express the esoteric truths which are concealed within them as well as the entertainment value which they have. Such a concept of the multiplicity of the meaning of one and the same factor was as little understood during his time as it is today. The nearest that the ordinary individual can get to this is to allow that a beautiful woman is a divine work of art. 
He is not able to perceive the beautiful woman and the divinity at the same time. This is the entire problem of the Sufi statement in a nutshell. Ibn al-Arabi's interpreter therefore reads on the surface as a collection of erotic poems. When he traveled to Aleppo in Syria, a stronghold of religious orthodoxy, he found that the divines of Islam were saying that he was a mere pretender, trying to justify his erotic poesy by claiming a deeper meaning. He immediately set to work on a commentary to bring the work into orthodox focus. The result was that the scholars were entirely satisfied because the author had helped to support their own interpretations of the religious law by his explanations of the meaning of his work. For the Sufi, however, there was a third meaning to the interpreter. Ibn al-Arabi, by using familiar terminology, was showing them that superficialities might be true, that human love might be completely valid, but that both of these things in actuality veiled an inner truth or were an extension of it. It is this inner reality which he refers to when he accepts all formalism yet claims a truth behind and beyond it. Professor Nicholson has thus translated one of the poems which most shocked the devout, who believed that theirs was the road to human salvation. My heart is capable of every form, a cloister for the monk, a fane for idols, a pasture for gazelles, the votary's Kaaba temple, the tables of the Torah, the Quran, Love is the creed I hold. Wherever turn his camels, love is still my creed and faith. The romantically minded person may take this as meaning that the familiar quantitative kind of love with which his mind automatically associates these words is what the greatest sheikh means. For the Sufi, it is Sufism of which the familiar love is only a part, a limited part beyond which under ordinary circumstances, the average person never goes.